This training video is to review the guidelines developed by the ClinGen Lumping and Splitting Working Group to assist bio-curators in defining the most appropriate disease entity or entities to curate for any given gene. The Lumping and Splitting Working Group was formed in April of 2017 and is comprised of clinicians and diagnosticians, nosological and ontological experts, as well as bio-curators. Traditionally, diseases have been characterized based on the phenotype of an individual. With the advent of technologies to quickly identify the genetic basis of disease, a predicament of multiple disease entities for any given gene was created. For the curation of gene disease relationships, ClinGen would like to focus on what the gene is telling us about disease, which poses the question, which disease entity do we curate when any given gene could be associated with multiple entities? As shown by these examples, the predicament is not confined to any one disease area or working group, but is present in all. Given that a gene can be associated with several phenotypes or disease entities, how can a curator assess if the condition they are curating is the most appropriate? If all curations are split for each phenotypic feature reported in the literature, we risk ad infinitum curations on ClinGen that might not reflect the true nature of each condition or association, nor the mutational spectrum of the gene. Conversely, if we lump all of the existing phenotypic features asserted for a gene into a greater known syndrome, we risk losing the intricacies of each condition or phenotypic feature. The general principle for lumping and splitting is that genes associated with a single published disease entity should only be curated for that condition unless there are indications to split specific phenotypic features into separate curations based on the guidance provided in our criteria. These are the four criteria to consider when assessing the disease entities associated with the gene of interest and determining the most appropriate entity for the curation. They include Assertion. What have nosological and ontological authorities reported about a gene's relationship with disease, as well as primary literature? Molecular mechanism. Are there differences in molecular mechanism underlying each asserted entity? The difference in molecular mechanism should be assessed initially at the gene level, if possible, before the protein and physiological levels. Phenotypic variability. Does a phenotype segregate consistently within a pedigree or between two or more unrelated probands with the same genetic variant? Or is there variable expressivity of phenotypes between family members and unrelated probands harboring the same genetic variant? Inheritance pattern. Are there differences in the inheritance patterns between the disease entities associated with the gene of interest? Do they represent distinct disease entities or rather are a continuum of disease. The decision to lump or split is a balance of criteria in which curators and experts should weigh the evidence to choose the appropriate disease entity or entities for the curations. Now I will review how the criteria were developed with examples. The first criteria is assertion or defining a disease entity. A curator should assess if one or more disease entities have been reported in association with the gene of interest. This can be done by reviewing nosological and ontological sites such as OMIM, Orphanet, and Monarch Initiative. Gene Reviews is another great resource. The primary literature can be used as a supplement and may be essential in newly associated gene disease relationships. On the left, we find that the gene NF1 is associated with a single disease entity per OMIM, being neurofibromatosis type 1. This example falls under our general principle that genes associated with a single entity should be curated only for that entity and not split unless the other criteria are met. Therefore, we would encourage the curation of NF1 for neurofibromatosis type 1, opposed to the curation of NF1 for a phenotypic feature associated with the full syndrome, such as Lish nodules. For the example on the left, we see that the gene P10 is associated with 12 disease entities, 
indicating review of the remaining criteria and literature may be needed to determine if these entities represent separate, unrelated diseases, or rather that some or all may be lumped into a broader, more inclusive disease entity to represent the spectrum of disease for variation in P10. Furthermore, you may find that a gene of interest is more newly associated with a disease, and therefore use of the remaining criteria will be important to establish whether this new association requires a separate curation or represents part of a known phenotype or disease entity and should be lumped within that entity. The second criteria is molecular mechanism. Assessment of molecular mechanism begins at the gene level and includes differences such as loss of function versus gain of function mutations for each asserted disease entity, as we observe for the example of the gene SCN8A. Other examples to consider would be domain-specific mutations or isoform-specific mutations that may occur between asserted disease entities for the gene of interest. Sometimes the molecular mechanism is not always clear or is in question. In these cases, it is best to assess whether the disease entities asserted have overlapping variation in the gene of interest or distinct variants between the asserted disease entities. Overlap of variants between two asserted disease entities indicates a disease spectrum and lumping of those entities for a single curation. Distinct variants may indicate a difference in molecular mechanism and the remaining criteria should be evaluated before making a formal split, especially in the absence of a defined molecular mechanism. The third criteria is phenotypic variability. Curators should assess how the gene, the variants in the gene, and the phenotypic features segregate between related and unrelated carriers. For the example shown, we can observe for the gene CAV3 that five of the six disease entities asserted for the gene have overlapping variants, indicating no difference in molecular mechanism, as observed by the figure on the left. We also find phenotypic variability among individuals harboring the same genetic variant within the same family, as indicated by the pedigree on the right. This would indicate that we should lump the five disease entities into one broader entity for the curation of CAV3. Of note, the image on the left shows that there are variants that are distinct and associated specifically with the phenotype long QT syndrome for CAV3. This would be the purple bubble and the left figure. This indicates that the long QT syndrome would not be lumped with the other five entities and would rather represent a second split curation for CAV3. The fourth and final criteria is inheritance pattern. Curators should assess if there are differences in the inheritance pattern between the disease entities. It is important to determine if the disease entities are distinct in which multiple varying phenotypes exist between them or rather that they are part of a continuum of disease in which the same phenotype is present with differing severity. For the example given, we find that the gene ATM is asserted with the disease entity ataxia telangiectasia and an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. While the susceptibility to breast cancer disease entity is inherited in an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Initially, this would support a split curation between the two disease entities. Furthermore, while individuals with autosomal recessive ataxia telangiectasia are at risk for developing breast cancer, those individuals with autosomal dominant variation in ATM and at risk for breast cancer are not at risk for developing the other phenotypic features associated with ataxia telangiectasia, thus further supporting separate split curations for these disease entities. Here is an outline of some reasons to lump gene disease curations. An assertion for only one disease entity has been made in the literature. No difference in molecular mechanism is observed among the disease entities asserted for a gene of interest. Intrafamilial phenotypic variability is as or more pronounced than interfamilial variability. The difference in the inheritance pattern for the disease entities is representative of a continuum of disease. For example, Mild carrier phenotypic features are observed in recessive disease or dosage impacts are observed for dominant disease. In these instances, we would note to curate for the well-established inheritance pattern 
and note the additional manifestations in carrier state or homozygous state and the gene curation interface and on evidence summaries. Lastly, the disease entity in question are seemingly part of a variable phenotype observed within a single organ system and there is insufficient evidence for any single phenotype. Specifically, if variants for each entity are variants of unknown significance and no distinguishing phenotype is observed, we would encourage lumping for a broader phenotype. Here is an outline of reasons to split a gene disease curation. An assertion for more than one distinct disease entity has been made in the literature. A well-established difference in molecular mechanism between two or more disease entities is observed. The representative disease entities between differing inheritance patterns are distinguishable with notable varying phenotypes or clinical management distinctions. And lastly, to dispute a disease entity asserted for the gene in question. In order to do this, one must have convincing evidence to dispute or refute the claim. This would be a very rare occurrence and the isolated disease entity being disputed or refuted cannot be included as part of the phenotypic spectrum observed in a syndrome associated with the gene of interest. In an effort to facilitate lumping and splitting issues, we developed pre-curation and binning strategies that aid in defining the appropriate disease entity for gene disease curations based on our criteria. This process occurs prior to the full curation as the disease entity, or more specifically, the Mondo disease ontology number, is required before beginning your gene disease curation in the ClinGen gene curation interface. Pre-curation is meant to be an expeditious, high-throughput approach to assess the disease entity prior to collecting the genetic and experimental data required for the full scoring and classification of a gene disease relationship. As shown, it is looking over the criteria for lumping and splitting, including recording the known assertions, reviewing the molecular mechanism, and more specifically looking at variant overlap between asserted disease entities, as well as noting the phenotypic features associated with each disease entity and the inheritance patterns. For pre-curation, it is recommended to start with sites such as OMIM and Orphanet to review the asserted disease entities for the gene in question. ClinVar is a great resource for review of variants associated with the gene of interest and can support in some cases delineation of the disease entities in question through the search mechanism on the site. Gene reviews may also be helpful if there is one written on your gene of interest. PubMed can also be used, but in this initial stage it is encouraged to look for reviews on the gene of interest to help with the assessment of the most appropriate disease entity rather than individual case reports. Of note, this is not meant to be an exhaustive search. In cases where a gene is associated with a single entity, pre-curation may not be needed. This is more important for genes that are asserted to have multiple disease entities and or phenotypic features. Curators may find when performing the full curation once delving into the primary literature that lumping and splitting issues arise. If this occurs, it may be necessary to revisit the lumping and splitting criteria and speak with an expert. The Lumpen and Splitting Working Group has developed a pre-curation template. The core template should include the asserted disease entities or phenotypes, inheritance pattern, molecular mechanism, more specifically including the variants associated with each disease entity, and the presenting phenotypes. It is also helpful to include the associated MIM phenotype numbers for the disease entities or phenotypes asserted for the gene of interest, as you would find in OMIM. These can give an indication of whether two or more phenotypes are considered a disease spectrum as they will have an identical MIM phenotype number. The remaining template can include information pertinent to the specific gene curation expert panel. Here's an example of the pre-curation template and strategy for the genes ACTN2, CAV3, and MYL2. For ACTN2, we find two asserted disease entities, yet they have the same MEM phenotype number, indicating they are part of a single disease spectrum. Furthermore, we find that both entities are inherited in an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. We also find an overlapping variant, as indicated in the color coding, between the two asserted disease entities, 
and we also find that the phenotype is confined to the heart. Therefore, ACTN2 was lumped as a variable phenotype in a single organ system and for the broader disease entity, in this case, intrinsic cardiomyopathy. For CAV3, we find that there are six asserted disease entities with separate MEM phenotype numbers. All are inherited predominantly in an autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. We also find five of the six disease entities show overlapping variants as indicated by the color coding, as well as overlapping phenotypic features. Therefore, the five overlapping disease entities were lumped into one broader disease entity termed caviolinopathy based on assertions for this disease nomenclature in the literature at the time of this curation. For MYL2, only one disease entity is asserted and no other claims have been made for a new disease association in the literature. Therefore, minimal precuration occurred and the final disease entity curated was the asserted hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. As an indication of time, the CAV3 precuration took approximately two hours to complete the worksheet. Now that we have reviewed precuration, the next step is to determine the appropriate disease entity and nomenclature for genes in which entities have been lumped. The Lumping and Splitting Working Group has thus developed a binning strategy. At its simplest form, the binning strategy is binary, as a gene may be associated with an isolated phenotype in which evidence suggests the gene is associated with a single phenotype or phenotypic feature with no risk of phenotypes arising in that organ system or elsewhere. Or the gene is associated with a syndrome in which evidence suggests the gene is associated with multiple varying phenotypes in multiple organ systems. However, some genes may be associated with a different presentation in which evidence suggests the gene is associated with multiple related phenotypes limited to one organ system. In these cases, the binning would suggest the gene is associated with a variable phenotype single organ system and may require development of new nomenclature. This would be done in conjunction with your gene curation expert panel. Of note, the binning strategy is not a measure to restrict curations as a gene can fit into more than one bin. Rather, it is a way to assess the most appropriate conditions to curate given the presentation of phenotypes and represents a form of lumping. Sometimes a gene curation expert panel may wish to curate genes for their potential to be associated with a phenotypic feature that has special testing, treatment, or management distinctions, but may not represent a truly distinct condition. For example, the phenotypic feature is part of a known syndrome. In these cases, the gene should be curated and classified for the syndrome and not for the isolated phenotype, unless the criteria we have reviewed have been met and indicate an appropriate split. For example, gene curation expert panels may wish to identify which syndromic genes have the potential to present with an apparent isolated phenotype or phenotypic feature to ensure that the appropriate genes are tested in patients presenting with that condition. Examples may be cardiomyopathy, hearing loss, and aortic dissection. In order to display the significance of a subset of isolated features of a syndrome, gene curation expert panels may find it useful to generate a table to depict the possibility of presenting as an isolated phenotype, as well as the presence, absence, or likelihood of individual features of interest for publication and testing purposes, as shown by the table example on the right. This data can be displayed simply as an annotated table without requiring a formal splitting of gene curation or use of the gene disease clinical validity classifications. For more information about lumping and splitting and to download our guidelines, pre-curation template, and review examples, please visit the Lumping and Splitting Working Group page on clinicalgenome.org. Thank you.